from a theatre company called Ashtar. Ashtar is the name of a goddess, goddess of love, fire, and prosperity by our ancient Mesopotamian people. At Ashtar Theatre, our target is to establish dialogue within our community, society, and beyond it by stimulating global local projects that raises issues of importance of the Palestinian people and our society, which are not usually tackled either by media, education, the politics, or otherwise. That's a rousing dialogue that might encourage transformation. Dialogue, according to Augusto Boal, is always dangerous because it creates this continuity between one thought and the other. Thus creating and permitting possibilities of infinite opinions and thoughts which might lead towards awareness. Awareness is a step towards transformation. And theater is an art of transformation, or at least this is what it should be. In our country, full of contradictions and suffers from oppression and occupation, the voice of the oppressed, the occupied, becomes most crucial and precious. Standing amidst the cruel reality and dealing with the harsh and brutal facts of the place and time is a sort of two ends. It can provide you with insight or trap you and imprison you in your own stereotypical reactions. In this case, no matter on which end you are standing, that of the oppressed or the oppressor, you cannot change reality. Unless you are transformed yourself and changed first and foremost. At Ashtar Theater, we'd like to see ourselves as action-oriented, stimulators of change, by helping our community to make a leap, a turning point, and a change in their praxis. Thus, our motto is a free and creative individual will bring national freedom. To free the people, we have to give them voice, a respected voice, to listen to them and dialogue with them. <laughs> Thus, we create programs that help to raise the voice of our people in order to preserve their rights and stimulate an atmosphere of productive dialogue among themselves and between them and the whole world. Oppression is a chain that entangles both the oppressed and the oppressor. Palestinians who are subject of daily harassment, humiliation, devastation, their manners, behaviors, reactions, even our aesthetics become a reflection of the subconsciously accumulated result of oppression. And we become victims of internalized oppressive manner, mannerisms. For real change to occur, the transformation has to happen by the oppressed, <coughs> at the oppressed end. Therefore, liberation or liberating the oppressed from the state of reaction, reflection and frustration, guiding them into action feats <coughs> would help them realize achievements. At Ashtar Theatre, as I already said, we like to see ourselves as agents of change. The Gaza Monologues is one of such projects. <coughs> Can we see the short video, please? is 
historical Palestine. In 48, that was divided this way. In 67, was divided that way. Straight to that way in 2010. These monologues 
have been translated into 20 languages. And some 1,000 young persons in 50 cities, around 36 countries, have worked on them and presented them on October 17th. <coughs> the performances in the different countries and in the different languages are still running. More countries are now getting involved. The Gaza Monologues is a growing snowball. Next month, the Gaza Monologues will be presented by one youth of each participating country at the UN on the 29th of November, the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. Two performances will take place. One at the General Assembly for the politicians, the representatives of, the, of each country, and the second for the general public. Later, in 2011, the Gaza Monologues writers who are imprisoned in Gaza, who are not allowed to leave, will try hard to make them leave Gaza and get out and perform at the European Union Parliament <coughs> in 2011, as well as the UNESCO headquarters. This is the project that started with an idea, an action against war, hoping to give all youth, no matter who they are, where they are, a hope to stand together in solidarity to be able to say enough, enough for wars, enough for occupation, <coughs> enough for humiliation, enough for oppression, and to say yes for the first and most valuable rights, the right to live in peace. I will leave you <coughs> with one of the monologues, just for you to have a taste of what these young people have been able to write. I'll read to you a monologue written by Yasmin Abu Ahmed, uh, born 1996 at the Shuja'iya refugee camp in Gaza. I want to be a specialist in the science of metaphysics, what is behind nature. You know why? Because I think that Gaza itself is behind nature. And I got so much from my presence here in Gaza that I'd like to share my that I'd like to transfer my skills to others. The Shuja'iyas camp is always the center of events. Each time the occupation wants to invade Gaza, they pass by our house. When the war began, people left their houses because as usual, the Shuja'iyya is supposed to be hit. And it's normal in this case to leave our house. Everyone was calling my dad to convince him to leave the house. My brothers from Algeria, my uncles from the States, my uncles from Ankara, the whole world has begun, has begged my father and he wouldn't budge, refusing to leave the Shuja'iyya. Three days with my mom having packed the house up and we're in suspended travel mode, we want to go to my sister's house to my sister's house because it's safer there. After we were exhausted from talking, he agreed and said, you go and I'll follow. How can we go and leave him? My mom was smart. She left the bread at home. And you know how dear bread is in the war. As soon as we got to my sister's place, she called him and said, Salman, we forgot the bread, bring it for us. And Salman fell in the trap and broke the bread, and we wouldn't let him leave. The next morning, we woke up to phosphorus, to a phosphorus bomb that fumed the street. We all started crying, our tears falling because of the phosphorus. The bomb was easier on, on us than that taunting. He said, I told you that stay home. <laughs> it's better for us. There is no place like home. And on it went. What added fuel to the fire is that the mosque and the house next to my sister's house were destroyed in the bombing. And you 
can imagine what my dad did to us. He wanted to take us back home immediately. No sooner had he finished his words than we were told that the house next to ours in Shujaiye was bombed and the front of our house ripped off. Then for the first time, all of us looked at that. We stayed at my sister's place. It became clear to us, wherever we were in Gaza, in the time of war, we were not safe. After the war, I started to always dress in a clean and tidy way, so that if I die, I would die a nice death. But it would be the biggest problem if I was hit by a rocket, because I'd become a hundred pieces, and I'd like to die in one piece. War, Gaza and Gaza's dreams. Our dream has to become to die a good death, not to live a good life.